University of Michigan. Um, as our moderator just mentioned, I'm looking at a language called Quayle de Link, um, known to speakers like many French influenced Creoles at home, we call it Patois. I'm going to call it KD because that is a lot easier um, as we go through the presentation. Um, as people who know me as a researcher, I like looking at little pieces of grammar that people have a hard time figuring out what they do and when it comes to Creole languages, especially within the nominal system, we have a lot of those. Um, so Quill Dominique KD in particular, just an introduction to it. It emerged on the small island of Dominica near Martinique and St. Lucia in the 1700s. It is French influenced, but it was also contributed to by Arawak speaking an indigenous population, um, imported and West Indian slaves from Bantu and Kuala backgrounds, as well as British English, because subsequently the island for about 200 years was part of the UK's Commonwealth system. So, a pretty interesting contact situation there. There's not much linguistic research that's been done on it um, in recent decades, uh, very little demographic documentation as well. So it's, hard to estimate the number of speakers. It is gradually um, dying out. At this point, it's usually used um, restricted to the home within um, the elder community um, of those speaking communities, and not just on the island, but in various diaspora groups throughout the world, particularly in London and the UK, because given the connection to Britain, that was a very common spot for speakers to immigrate to for job opportunities and that sort of thing. Just a quick overview of what the nominal system looks like. Um, above this dotted line, I have um, nominal um, segments of the nominal grammar that have different kinds of alert markings. We do have what's commonly pointed to as a definite structure with this post-nominal la at the end. That say at the beginning marking indicates plurality. Uh, we also have a structure that I found in my own corpus work that I hadn't found in the literature on this language, where you have two laws repeated after the noun. This seems to have sort of a locative reinforcement reading. Um, I also mention it as being akin to the, um, say, non-standard that their book kind of construction within English. <laughs> um, and then, of course, we do have what is traditionally referred to as its demonstrative structure, when you add this saw marking before the law after the noun. We do have an overt indefinite determiner, it's pre-nominal, and we also have a partitive reading um, when you add this marker sick, which is akin to sum. Below this dotted line, though, there are a lot of different uses of bare nouns, as has been noted in many um, French and French Creole varieties. Um, I can have a bare noun to have a very strictly generic reading, so all books in the world have X and Y properties. I can have um, maybe an existential reading, something more akin to what someone would refer to as a, as a bare plural, so maybe there are books on a table, I would have a bare noun in this context. Um, there's also bareness used for uniqueness. Um, so if I'm talking about the sun, typically in conversation, we're talking about the one that's in our solar system. Whenever I mention the sun, it's going to be bare. Um, but then we end up with what I like to call wild card, bare nouns, that people have been questioning what to do with for quite a while, where in context, speakers shift in and out of referring to something as bare that would normally have some of these markers attributed to it. So in this case, I could have leave for book by itself to be the book, a book, some books, etc. cetera. Um, so figuring out how speakers um, modulate that fluctuation in their grammar is a rather complex question. So the two things that I really wanted to look at um, when I started thinking through this grammar was on paper we have definite marking, maybe a logative reinforcement marking, a bunch of marking, but if you actually look into the small amount of, liter of literature on this and to speakers' use of these structures in the wild, um, you can get this demonstrative, dictic like reading from any of these first three categories. And so how do speakers choose one? How do they interpret the input they're getting um, from the speaker when they're on the listener side of the conversation? How do they pick a didactic form? And then when it comes to these wild card bare nouns, what are the constraints on when those can be used? Because some of my speakers use them all over the place in their conversations. My, one of my speakers, who has taken it upon herself to teach some of KD to the younger members of her community, she's in more of a teacher role, she feels a bit more pressure to regularize her grammar, she used almost none of these. 
and so she uses a more, say, Englishified um, propensity for having a definite marker where we might have the, and so she wouldn't have as many of these. So there is variation, and so how do, how do speakers navigate these fluctuating aspects of the grammar? So my first research question, what pragmatic factors guide speakers, speakers' choices when it comes to definite and demonstrative markers to express statuses? This is not the first time someone's asked this question. Perhaps of KP, yes, but when it comes to this language group as a whole, French influenced Creoles, it's something that's come up occasionally in the literature for many decades. Usually, though, the research is focused on um, a formal syntactic investigation. And so um, researchers like Desprez have mentioned that this post-nominal law is often said to have a deactic force, um, but no pre precise empirical tests have been done to support it. Um, so usually this is kind of mentioned as a footnote and then put off to the side. Um, so we have this canonical form where we would have both saw and law present to mean this or that. There's no distal or proximal distinction in this language. But we do have law showing up in these odd deactic situations, um, some that were picked up by Douglas Taylor in his work in the 70s. Um, what we notice in phrases like the state guide law, which would be canonically the houses, but it might also mean those houses, these houses potentially within the context. You even see law and its a truncated form a after a vowel showing up as a deictic like marker for items that aren't nominal at all. So if I want to say today, but I add a at the end, jodia, then I have something that means this very day, almost as if I'm pointing to that point in time and enforcing it in this deictic way. And then of course we have this duplicated la la uh, that doesn't come up in the literature for KD, um, something akin to it has been mentioned for Haitian, but where you have this that there kind of reading. So this put me in the position of trying to tease apart, okay, how do I sit down and decide when law by itself is being used? Is it really akin to this definite marker as we would con traditionally construe it? There seems to be something deictic, something demonstrative going on. How do I tease this apart? Uh, and so I went through some of the literature on this, things that people had suggested characterize demonstratives, may characterize both groups, and then definites only. Um, when it comes to maybe a dis discourse deictic use that we often see with a demonstrative marker, I'm not too concerned about this because I want to actually look at contexts where I have la or sala marking a noun, but sala in its predominant form is used. Um, in this case, if I want to say that was funny, Sala would be the that there. Um, but as far as actual markers that show up on nouns, we do have mention of them, them being used in a, a hero old sort of context, so something that's familiar to the hearer, um, recognizing shared knowledge, um, something that's been brought up in research on sign languages where we're trying to figure out um, what index morphemes are doing in this language as if they're demonstratives or definites. Um, something that Gluda Pova and Lil Martin in their one on ASL mentioned was that when you have something that is very clearly in this demonstrative category, it can often be used to indicate one among many possible reference. So if I have many blocks in front of you and I want you to pick up that one, then you use that, that. You can't just say pick up the block because I'd be asking you which one. Um, so this distinction among many possible reference use. But both demonstratives and definites have this overlap where they can both be used in situations where something is physically present, where you can have a kind of pointing use for both of them. Um, they also are both correlated with having a discourse old market, something that's been previously mentioned in a um, And then for the definite only category, this got the most difficult. A lot of research on this is coming from work on English, French, German, etc. And so there's mention of definites being used for unique and generic nouns, which of course in this language are systematically left bare, so not as relevant for us. But what is relevant is this idea that definites have this unique ability to be used in an associative anaphoric case, or what Prince in her work on information status and I call it inferables. So if I say I got onto the bus and then I mentioned the driver, I mark the driver as something familiar because it is logical that the, the bus would have a driver, it fits the context. It's new, but it's treated as old, because I assume you can inference your way to the fact that there would be a driver there. So a couple of different distinctions. So what I'm getting out of this is both to 
demonstratives and definites are associated with this pointing state at the center, discourse oldness. Definites only have this more inferable characteristic that they can take on, while only demonstratives have this very strong um, tendency towards um, specificity, which I actually put at the top here. So I can have, um, I bought the house, meaning a very specific one. I can also say, I want the house to be big. I haven't really picked out a specific house yet. I can have either one of those uses with the definite marker. With the demonstrative, though, I, I exclusively get a specific reading. I bought that house. There's, there's only one particular one that I have individualized already. So we do, with demonstratives, get this very strong tendency towards specificity, as well as being here old and distinguishing among various reference. The other thing I wanted to consider was under what conditions we have this shift to optional bareness within the language. It has something has been noted in other French influence Creole languages, but each language seems to have its own unique way of modulating this part of the grammar. Um, for work on Guadalupean Creole, which is closely related to KD, um, researchers like Gabe have suggested maybe the item has to be topical within that point of the conversation, previously mentioned, maybe something that's boring going on. Um, researchers like Christy have suggested maybe this should be even more broadly construed. Maybe it's just any referent that is familiar to both speakers. Um, she notices, she mentions this briefly, it's not the focus of her research, but she mentions that when she listens to speakers of this language, things that are, say, common landmarks, if there's like one river in your town, and you say that yay for a river, you just leave it there because there's only one you're probably talking about. So, different ideas of how this would work, but usually not something that's systematically investigated. So what I wanted to do was look at information status, specificity, and maybe type of deixis, spatial, social, um, temporal, if that would help me at all with this la and sala distinction. Apply those to all the examples I could possibly get of wild card bear nouns and these different deictic markings, and see under what conditions these particular forms are used by speakers, under what conditions they are acceptable. So what I decided to do was actually do some field work. Usually, um, in the literature I was looking through, um, maybe old folk tales would be used, um, or a little bit of introspection by the speaker, and so I really wanted to get um, data that was a bit more robust. So I went and visited family in the UK, um, started going throughout the area looking for speakers. I have six total speakers. I have some of their demographic information here. You're interested, but I guided them through a variety of tasks. The three main ones being a narration task, where they told their partner the story illustrated in a wordless picture book. So no difficulties of orthography here. This is not a language that my speakers usually write, and I didn't want any influence from English orthography either. Um, casual conversation, talk about whatever you want for as long as you want. Completely open, just me there with my video camera capturing as much as I could. And then the stacks and squares gestures task, um, which was devised by Cooper Ryder and his um, collaborators, in which I have one participant acting as a director, seeing um, a layout, an array of, of pattern that they're instructing the builder, their partner, to construct um, out of these um, kind of craft items, boxes, bean bags, etc. But it's a very good way to elicit demonstratives and also keep your speakers in a game-like state, very casual situation. I then use this um, qualitative coding program, Atlas TI, some of you might be familiar with it. It's sort of an kind of updated form of many things you can do with the lawn. Uh, and I went through my conversation narration tasks, pulled out all of the nominal structures that I could possibly find, and coded them for what their more syntactic form was, specificity, information status, type of day exists. Within the steps and squares gesture task, I focused solely on um, those nominal structures that were marked by one of my deictic options, and I added coding for whether or not there was pointing to the object being mentioned. This presents some challenges. Um, one of my, you know, when you're working with an, with an elderly population and doing a gesture experiment, that can get a little difficult. So one of my participants had some severe back problems, so some of her data I had to exclude when she was sitting speaking and taking rest time, because of course she wouldn't be producing gestures at that point. Um, both of my participants within a pair narrated the same story, which I thought would be good to get some consistency across speakers, but then you run into the issue of, 
Is the story more familiar the second time? Does that affect the morphological marking? Marking oldness to discourse gets complicated in terms of, do I do that by scene of the story, um, by trial within a task, because speakers are going to organize that a bit differently? Um, of course, the objects in the stacks and squares task are going to be familiar to my speakers. They're here in present, and I give them a couple of practice trials, so most of the time I'm going to get some discourse old in those cases. And I let my speakers self-select their partner. So they are going to be very familiar with each other. I have a husband and wife, two friends, a mother and daughter. They're going to have some shared knowledge that I'm going to have to try to pick up on from the outside because they're family, right? And so there are going to be some things that they share that I have to wade through as I'm trying to cover this data. So as far as my results, I ended up pulling out 994 total nominal structures. And within that, um, about 3% of them have this wild card, wild card bear categorization. Um, only half a percent of them showed up with this law law marking. It's pretty rare, which is probably why it hadn't been mentioned very much. 4% um, with this traditional saw law demonstrative marking, and then a whole lot of law markings, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Within my wild card bear nouns, there definitely is um, an indication that these items are highly familiar to speakers. They're very commonly discourse old, as well as being here or old and specific, which is something that I expected, but I wanted to get some quantitative backing for that. For my la la re locative reinforcement items, which are pretty rare, they always in involve some sort of spatial dances, pointing to a particular item in space, always involve literal physical pointing. Usually when the speaker was frustrated, like, no, that one, that one right there, that one. So I'm going to keep repeating law until you get it. Um, and then it almost always singles out a particular reference from other options. It's kind of lock and reinforce when I want that one in that position. Sala fit the demonstrative um, categories traditionally construed. High incidence of specificity, often used to single out one of the multiple reference, um, but also use with pointing, and had both spatial and temporal dictated expressions um, that Sala was applied to. Law is, of course, where it gets complicated, and that's why it's been mentioned so much in the literature and then left in a footnote, and we don't really want to wade through what all it can do. So, it does have some traditionally demonstrative-only properties. It can be used, pretty rarely, but it can be used to single out one among many potential reference. Um, it is spatially deictic and nearly exclusively marks specific nouns. It does have some definite only properties, though. Occasionally, I find it in those inferable contexts. The, we're on a bus, so I mentioned the driver as if it's familiar to you. And then, of course, these ambiguous traits that are shared by both demonstratives and definites. Tendency towards being discourse old, a high coincidence with pointing, physical pointing as a post-speech gesture. So what do I get from this? In terms of responses to my first question about how speakers um, coordinate their choices across deictic forms. It seems like type of deictic and information status are important in making that choice, sort of. So LAVA having this locative reinforcement reading, I think that is pretty clearly indicated in the results. But there is so much overlap in the traits of SALA and LA, um, which is probably why research Researchers have been really confused about what to call them. I think Taylor uses the term particularizer to talk about law because he's not really sure what it's doing within the grammar. Saw law, the, what's traditionally construed as the demonstrative construction, is the only one that can be used in non spatial dictic contexts. So when I'm talking about a point in time, this is the one that comes up. Um, and law has is the only one of these two structures that can show up in an inferable context, which is traditionally what we associate with a definite marker. But in all the other respects, they seem to be interchangeable, which is actually what one of the researchers mentioned as a point of perplexity for her. So I need either to do more research to figure out what can distinguish them, or maybe just accept that at this current point, there is so much overlap that is there some sort of hate free variation, because I feel like there's got to be something guiding, so this is very frustrating for me. Um, in terms of bare nouns, I think things are a little bit clearer. Um, specificity and oldness to both hear and discourse are very important. It seems to almost give particularly familiar reference a quasi-unique um, uh, um, privilege to then be marked as bare, just like something like the sun would be marked as bare. Um, 
So no hard and fast rules. Obviously, some speakers use these more than others, but it is in this context where you are most likely to be able to use one, and of course, your listeners still understand you. Um, no, I'm at the end of my time. This is my last slide in terms of future questions. Um, I just want to know, are there other aspects of the discourse of the reference? I don't know, animacy, anything. I'm looking for something to distinguish when La and Sala can be used. Um, if they are at this point of being very interchangeable, is there some sort of change in progress happening, potentially? Um, are we in this stage of La going from some sort of weekly demonstrative marker to maybe taking on more of the properties of a definite article? I'm not sure. I'm going to see if I can find some historical workings within this language to compare to. Um, and for both this La and Sala variation and this variable use of, of wild card bear nouns, the speakers accommodate to each other. This is something that varies in terms of how much you use um, this various construction and whether or not you use La or Sala in making a, um, a dynamic um, structure. So maybe there's some sort of accommodation across speakers in the same conversation. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.